Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to everybody to, uh, to Stanford. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about why um, it might be interesting to think a little about uh, catalysis and catalysts. And uh, let's see if this works. It works. Imagine that you want to harvest solar energy and you want to store it somehow, then by far the most efficient way of storing it is by storing it in chemical bonds. That's what nature has done for us for, with the fossil fuels. And we, we know very well how to use the energy stored in chemical bonds for, for making useful work. And uh, there are various uh, ways in which you can store or transform the energy of, uh, of uh, incoming sunlight to energy in chemical bonds. You can let plants harvest the energy first, and then you need to transform these plants into some base chemicals or fuels that we can use. And for that, you need a catalyst, or at least one catalyst. You can also first make electricity, and then you would need a catalyst, an electrocatalyst, in order to transform that energy into chemical bonds. Or you could hope that you could have a direct photoelectrochemical process where you directly take the photons, feed them into a system, and make a chemical with a high enough energy that you have stored energy in it. Those are the three possibilities we have. And in each case, we need one or several catalysts. <coughs> now, don't we have those? And the answer is no. As a rule, the answer is no. Um, and uh, that's simply because the requirements that we have for these catalysts are quite stringent. Let me first remind you what a catalyst is. It is a material, in this case, that will lower the activation energy for some process that we want to happen uh, and not lower the activation energy for other processes that we don't want to happen. So it's a, it's a material, typically nanoparticles, that is engineered at the surface to do exactly the chemistry we want, we want and not the chemistry we don't want. That's the challenge. And of course, for this to work, we need these catalysts to be very efficient. We don't want to lose a lot of the incoming energy. Um, they need to be stable. We cannot replace the catalyst every half hour or every second day, for that matter. And for this to make a real dent in the energy problems, we need the catalyst to be made out of earth abundant materials. Otherwise, we're not really solving any problems. People have tried to do this for decades. And the usual approach has been trial and error. You try something out, you use your intuition, you move somewhere else and, and try to do something better. And uh, up until now, that has failed. So the question is, and the challenge to you actually, is can we do better? And the hope, of course, the reason you're at a university is that probably if we understand it better, we could do better. So that's the, what, what, what I'll be talking about here. Um, let, me, let me be a little bit more specific here and just uh, give you a couple of examples of, of where we are. This here is a, a schematic. Um, photoelectrochemical device for making a fuel, say hydrogen. You have a semiconductor for absorption of the photons. You make electrons and holes. You use the holes to get to a catalyst, that's the green thing here, that can split water and evolve oxygen and make protons. And then you, the electrons go to another catalyst, the blue, that will be kind enough to take the protons and recombine with the electrons to form hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest fuel. And uh, it's summed up here. So we need the absorber. We need the water splitting catalyst. And we need the fuel production catalyst. The simplest fuel is hydrogen. But of course, what we really want to do is take, say, CO2, combine it with protons and electrons, and form a hydrocarbon or an alcohol or some other liquid fuel or chemical that we can use. That would be artificial photosynthesis. You can also actually take nitrogen, but that's a different matter. I'll, I'll just talk about these three processes, 
the water splitting, the hydrogen evolution, and say a few words about CO2 reduction and where we are. And where are we? This is the best we can do when it comes to water splitting. Here's the reaction, take water, and uh, you make oxygen, and you make protons and electrons. You need to feed energy into this. I'll get back to that in a moment. And here is a measured current density as a function of the potential we apply. This is the potential that you get by, uh, from your PV, right? The potential you apply. And high current density, of course, means that you're splitting a lot of water and, and uh, vice versa. Now, is this good or bad? Well, it depends on what is the, what could we hope for. This is what we could hope for. This potential, 1.23 volts, that is the potential that from pure thermodynamics should be sufficient to split water. So you can see here that we have to go to something like 0.4 volts higher. That's a loss of some 30% right there. This is the best we've got today. Here's the second best, sorry, the second best is iridium dioxide, same story. This is where we are. Now, have we done anything better over the last few years? Yes. These iridium and ruthenium are both noble, scarce metals. You, you, you really don't want that. And we do have better catalysts now, some iron cobalt oxides or cobalt oxides, or several have been, have been uh, heavily uh, uh, publicized. But you can uh, see here, none of them are better than the iridium oxide that was discovered 25 years ago. So we've sort of hit a wall here. It's up to you to find ways out of this wall, or over this wall, I should say, or through this wall, for that matter. But this is one of the big challenges that we have. Here's a, and here's a case, that's the other part, the second process, the hydrogen evolution, where we do have a catalyst that works extremely well. This is current density as a function of potential uh, for hydrogen evolution over platinum nanoparticles. Here, the equilibrium potential is zero. And uh, now the potential is counted negative for reasons that I, I don't understand. But uh, this is how it's conventionally done. You see that you have an onset basically at the thermodynamic potential. We have a great catalyst for this. There's one problem with the catalyst. It's platinum, right? If we were to cover the roofs with this, then it would amount to cover all the roofs with the platinum. That is just not going to happen. So here we have a good catalyst, but we don't have a catalyst that we can afford. Anybody can afford. This can never be part of a solution. Uh, there are others that are good. This is measured current densities as a function of some parameter that I'll get back to. But you see that platinum is good, so is rhenium, palladium, rhodium, iridium. Everything that is good is expensive. Nothing that is good is cheap. <laughs> well, it seems you, you may have discovered that in you know, other, other aspects of life as well. But that's the way it is here. <laughs> what about CO2 reduction? Here is measured current densities. Uh, in the group of Tom Hamiu, and you may meet him later today. Um, going up here, you see it starts around minus 0.8 volts. Thermodynamically, it should start at plus 0.2 volts. We lose one volt per electron, that is one electron volt. There are eight electrons, eight electron volts, 800 kilojoules per mole is what we we'll lose if we want a high current density for uh, CO2 reduction. Hopeless. So, where are we? We, uh, we have catalysts for splitting water, but they're not terribly efficient. We have good catalysts for, for hydrogen evolution, but they are, they are too expensive. And we have uh, no catalyst whatsoever for very efficient CO2 reduction. This is where we are. This is where you come into the picture, because we need solutions here. I will uh, just touch on a couple of these. Uh, first, I'll tell a, a success story. And it's for the simplest process for hydrogen evolution. So why is it that platinum is good? 
Well, it's very simple, actually. This is a free energy diagram starting with protons and electrons. Then you get adsorb hydrogen on the surface, and then you eject it as H2. And you can see platinum is nice. It's easy to get on, easy to get off. Gold, hopeless. Molybdenum, nickel, hopeless, easy to get on, difficult to get off. You need, there's a sweet spot right in the middle, and platinum is right there. And all, everything cheap is not there. Uh, that's what you saw before. Now, nature actually has catalysts that can do this. There are enzymes that are very good at hydrogen evolution. Nitrogenases and hydrogenases are classes of enzymes that can do hydrogen evolution quite efficiently. If we calculate, these are calculated again, uh, the binding energy of hydrogen on these, then you see that nature has actually made cheap platinum. And it's made of, in this case, iron sulfide clusters. In this case, it's an iron nickel sulfide cluster. So there are inorganic clusters in the middle of these enzymes that can do this chemistry as well, almost as well as platinum. We, we, uh, we can take that as a hint that there is a solution out there, but we need to think radically different than trying another metal and another metal and another metal. And what we did was actually we, uh, we used uh, computers to search. So we can do these quantum mechanical calculations fast enough that we can search through hundreds and thousands of, of different compounds and see if we can find something that works. And uh, one thing that we found is that if you take molybdenum disulfide, layered compound, very popular these days, and you look at what happens at the edge, there you can actually bind sulfur with, uh, sorry, bind uh, hydrogen with roughly the, the right uh, binding energy. And uh, if you hear our experimental data, again from the group of, of Tom Harmio, here's platinum, never to be beaten, but here's actually some molysulfide. And uh, you have, in terms of the onset, probably 0 0.1, 0 0.15 EV, that is your loss, but this is all acceptable if you want to, uh, to make this work. I'll just skip this and uh, just say one, one word about why it's much more difficult for the water splitting. Here's the same kind of free energy diagram calculated for water splitting over ruthenium dioxide. You go from water, you get OH, O, OOH, and then O2 rip off electrons and protons one at a time to get you from water to oxygen. And it's, of course, uphill. That's where you need the energy that comes with the electrons. The problem is that if you go to the equilibrium potential where this free energy and this is the same, then you see that you have to traverse quite a high barrier to get from one to the other. That's why it doesn't work very well. You need to go to an even higher potential, then it's all downhill. What would you want? You would really like all of these steps to have the same height, because then you, they would all collapse to the zero line at the same potential. And you see, they're not all the same height. Then you say, why? Well, can't we just then find materials where we can adjust these independently to get to the right? to the right uh, 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 sort of equal step height kind of situation. And that turns out to be extremely difficult. And here's the reason. I'll just show you this here. This is calculated binding energy of OOH. That's this level here. Plotted as a function of the binding energy of OH. That's here. And what you see is for lots of different materials, they all follow the same, a, a linear relationship, a scaling relationship between the two. What it means is you cannot vary them independently for these classes of, of materials. When you cannot vary them independently, you're stuck. Why can't you vary them independently? Of course, because the binding of oxygen to the surface, whether it comes from OH or OOH, is basically the same. Some very fundamental uh, reasons why this works this way. And this is really what we're up against. Uh, I'll go to the uh, last uh, slide here to uh, show you what this, again, 
We have the scaling relation. This is exactly what gives you this wall. It turns out for CO2 reduction, we have exactly similar scaling relations that give exactly similar walls, except here the wall is at an even higher old potential. So what do we need to do by, by we? I, I'm thinking very much about you, your generation. We need to find ways of beating these scaling relations. And uh, for that, we need to think in terms, think the way that biology has solved this by not doing this on planar surfaces, but by having sort of three-dimensional structures that can come in and grab a molecule from the other side and feel whether it's a long OOH or a shorter OH bond. But this takes a totally new way of thinking about this, and it takes totally new ideas, perhaps on the computer, and it takes totally new synthetic uh, schemes to make these. That's the challenge that we have in this field. And uh, I think I will stop here. And also just flash on here all the people that contributed to the, to the work that I talked about here. OK, questions? Say that again, sorry. Is there a push to actually use enzymes? Yes, there is. And, and there lots of people are, are trying to do that. The problem is, of course, that the enzyme, the active site sits in this big goo of uh, organic uh, stuff, right? And that means that per square centimeter of surface area, there's very little of these. So if you want something very efficient, where you can do a lot over a, a small surface area, then this is not terribly efficient in that sense. So nature has made it to do other things, but, but not for exactly this. So I think we, we need to take inspiration from the way it's been solved, but we need to find separate solutions. That's, that's, that's my guess. Yes. Um, for long-term energy storage, I think what in your opinion are advantages of, of um, this kind of chemical storage over batteries? Well, right now, for instance, the energy density is about two orders of magnitude larger or three here than in a, in a, in a battery. So in that sense, uh, there are definite advantages. You can keep it for longer. Many, many, many good reasons. Let me also say, I, I indicated it on, on, on the first slide, but I think um, an important part of this is just to make chemicals. 10% of all energy goes into making chemicals. Uh, so if we, if we uh, just to make the chemicals that make all the materials that are around us, we need just 10% 10, 10 of, of, uh, of all the energy that is, that is used on, on, on Earth. So just for that, we need this. But uh, it, it does have a much larger energy density. It's much faster. So actually, when, when, you, when you fill up your tank in a minute or two, I mean, you could never do that. Even Tesla's uh, very, very uh, fast uh, chargers, they take a couple of hours for what you do in a, in a couple of minutes. Yeah. So what's your professional opinion about uh, nanomaterials applied in analysis? I mean, essentially all catalysts are nanomaterials. So in that sense, that, I mean, heterogeneous catalysis was nanotechnology well before nanotechnology became a... So uh, uh, household will. We, if, if by this you mean the importance of being able to tailor make nanomaterials, then that's essential here. So being able to tailor the surface of nanoparticles is the name of the game. There's a question here. Uh, yeah. What are the big industrial businesses driving research here, other than universities? Um, in general, in, in catalysis, all the, all, the all the big chemical companies have enormous investments in, the, in this area. Uh, we are talking, I mean, 
all, no, that's not true, 90, 90, more than 90% of all chemical industry relies on, on catalysis. So, so there's an enormous amount of in, investment there by everybody. I mean, you know, say Dow or, or, or Exxon, Mobil, or, you know, all of them have uh, very, very large investments there. The, um, the new part here, namely the fact that you need to find catalysts for totally new processes, that's not driven necessarily by the oil companies, I can tell you. Uh, that is driven to a large extent by universities these days. In the Department of Energy. What? In the Department of Energy. I'm thinking of that as an academic uh, sponsor, but yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. And national labs. Yes. Is the question. I'm just curious as how you use the uh, site facilities in your work and research. Uh, we the computers there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't have time to get into that. But obviously, if you want to say characterize nanomaterials, then uh, using the synchrotron is uh, is a very very good uh, uh, way of doing that. But I should say Slack. It has facilities and use that, but Slack also has a, an independent research portfolio like any national lab. So in that sense, uh, the, the partnership we have between Stanford University and Slack is just to develop this science. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Jens again.